Uh, hello everyone and welcome to the next in a series of trends videos that provide practical summaries of current medical topics to aid healthcare professionals in their clinical practice. If you missed the earlier videos, let me reintroduce myself as Felix David, the Managing Editor of Trends in Neurology and Men's Health. Today I'm joined by Professor Mike Kirby, Editor of Trends in Neurology and Men's Health. And uh, despite the name that is showing up on the Zoom meeting, uh, it is actually Jeff Hackett, Consultant in Sexual Medicine at Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust, to go over some relevant studies that have been recently published in regards to testosterone and COVID-19. Now, this is evidently a very current topic, so without further ado, I'm going to dive in and ask Mike, uh, why is COVID-19 so relevant to men? Well, I think it's very relevant. Um, actually Felix because if you look at mortality data in the nearly 50,000 patients who have died in the UK two-thirds of them are men and I think for men under the age of 85 if you look at the rate it's about 50 per 100,000 whereas for women it's only 25. Now we've previously covered this in a, in a video webcast before as to some of the reasons why men are at greater risk of dying. But today we're really going to focus on testosterone. Yep, that's absolutely correct. So as mentioned, you will actually, we have done a previous webinar on why men are more affected by COVID-19 infection and the link to that video will be available on the website with this video. So I suppose uh, moving on uh, again, Mike, what is currently known about the role of testosterone in the overall mortality risk? Well, I think actually the American Neurology Association summed this up because they have stated that men with a low testosterone should be strongly counseled that they are at increased cardiovascular risk. And I think the fact that COVID-19 reduces testosterone levels is going to compound the problem and the mortality rates in the men who already have underlying conditions that predispose to an already low testosterone. I mean, just to mention a few, you've got type 2 diabetes, you've got obesity, coronary heart disease, heart failure, CKD, COPD, HIV, uh, using opiates regularly, etc. So these men are at a double risk because of the effect of the virus on the testosterone levels during the illness. Okay, that was an excellent summary. So the basis of this talk, so on in regards to what you've just said about testosterone, Jeff, I'm gonna pass over to you and ask, uh, ask if you could tell us about what its relationship is to COVID-19. Well, what, what the statistics show at the moment is that your chances of actually testing positive for COVID-19 are equal between men and women. So the infection rates are similar. It's what actually happens uh, is, is different between men and women. And the, the major reason for this is that we feel that, uh, uh, that the COVID virus attacks the testes. And studies from uh, China, from uh, Germany and from Italy uh, show that men who are admitted with COVID-19 infection have catastrophically low levels of testosterone. And that the lower the level of testosterone on admission, the greater the chance that they will be going to intensive care or even to die. Uh, and what is clear is that in contrast to a fall in testosterone level, which has been noted in previous severe infections like flu, in the case of COVID-19, this is actually a primary hypogonadism. In other words, the virus is attacking the testes and the body is responding to that primary attack by trying to produce more LH and FSH to fight it off, but failing. And obviously, if you're a patient who, who is uh, previously at high risk because you've got, uh, as Mike said, type 2 diabetes, obesity, um, COPD, your reserve to be able to fight off that acute insult of the COVID-19 is greatly reduced. And therefore, it seems common sense that you will, you will increase the ability of patients to resist COVID-19 attack if you restore their testosterone levels to as normal as possible uh, uh, before uh, the onset of 
second and third wave pandemics. So yeah, as thank you for that. And as has been mentioned, there's lots and lots of data that is coming out about this. So Mike, if I could pass it back to you um, to ask how we can use all of this recently published data to inform current practice. Well, I think first of all, we need to identify men in the community who already have a low testosterone and manage that. Uh, so that will reduce their risk and hopefully make them more resistant uh, to becoming severely ill. Uh, when they contract the virus. I mean, all we're doing with testosterone replacement is putting back what should be there normally. We're not giving them anything extra. We're just putting them back into normal uh, physiological state because a low testosterone increases the whole portfolio of cardiovascular risk factors. Um, from a practical point of view, drugs that improve endothelial function because COVID-19 attacks the vascular endothelium right throughout the body are likely to be very helpful. Uh, I'm thinking about PD-5 inhibitors, statins, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, um, and of course there's quite good evidence now for using steroids in these patients. And because it's a pre-thrombotic condition, uh, there's a lot of thrombosis going on, particularly in the pulmonary vasculature, antithrombotics are also very important. But I believe that replacing testosterone is potentially also very important. But the fact is, there are no randomized controlled trials to support that intervention, which I, you know, I think the lack of evidence doesn't mean that we shouldn't use common sense in managing these patients effectively. And you know, I think PD-5 inhibitors are a very exciting class of drugs because they do all sorts of useful off-label things that might be very, potentially very helpful when these people are very ill. Now, testosterone uh, reduces inflammatory cytokines, so testosterone might reduce that sort of cytokine storm that appears in IT units when these people are very ill. But PD-5 inhibitors improve endothelial function, uh, they're antioxidant, they're anti-inflammatory, they improve the immune response, uh, they have anti-apoptotic uh, properties, and all of those could be really useful in men who uh, are seriously ill with COVID-19. So I think, again, no clinical trial evidence, but it's common sense, I think, to use these drugs opportunistically to try and keep these people alive. But um, perhaps Jeff will talk a bit more about PD-5 inhibitors because I think they're very important here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that leads us nicely onto the next question, which is on the subject of PD-5 inhibitors, as there is some current controversy on the variation in CCG guidance on their prescription. So, yep, Jeff, back to you. So could you please give us an overview on the current situation and if there is any update? Yes, um, Mike and I have been advocating the uh, use of PD-5 inhibitors on a daily basis for some years, particularly in patients with type 2 diabetes. And Mike gave you exactly the reasons why they would benefit a patient with type 2 diabetes, who after all has a 75% chance of having uh, ED uh, and has very low response rates to on-demand uh, uh, PD-5 inhibitors. Uh, the, they also improve insulin sensitivity, renal blood flow, peripheral vascular disease. They reduce diabetic neuropathy. Uh, they uh, are a licensed treatment for BPH, which um, patients with type 2 diabetes have higher rates of. Uh, but against that, we've been fighting because uh, uh, previous to um, 2018, they were relatively expensive. Uh, and so, therefore, uh, a lot of CCG guidance. Uh, suggested that they should not be provided uh, and in fact they were uh, interpreted as being blacklisted uh, even though the advice was just do not prescribe. Many CCGs went even further by saying that even if the patient was taking them and they were working they should be stopped and they should be put back onto an on-demand treatment that had uh, previously failed. Now, this was causing a lot of difficulty for those of us working uh, in the field.
But then in August uh, 2019, uh, NICE uh, launched a clinical knowledge summary where they made three important statements. The first one was that uh, uh, on-demand therapy is totally unacceptable for a large number of couples suffering from ED, which begs the question, if a treatment is unacceptable for a large number of people, why is it the only thing that the, uh, the CCGs offer? Secondly, they said that in patients who fail to respond to on-demand therapy, 50% will respond to daily therapy if they're converted, which begs the question, why, if we have a treatment that will work for 50% more patients, do we give them a treatment that's unlikely to work first? I rarely have patients who come to me and say, doctor, what's the second best treatment that I can have for, for my disabling condition? And thirdly, they pointed out that if patients fail with an on-demand PD-5 inhibitor, if their testosterone is less than 12 nanomoles per litre, they are highly likely to respond to testosterone replacement and a daily PD-5 inhibitor. So NICE CKS clearly uh, lays out uh, the optimal way for treating patients nowadays, but unfortunately, the CCG guidance, a lot of it was given some years ago, and it needs to be revised now, not waiting for another five years. It needs to fall in line with NICE guidance. Yeah, that's exactly the point, Jeff. Uh, what's happening at the moment, of course, is that you know, sildenafil is being prescribed, not sildenafil. And, uh, you know, sildenafil is really not appropriate, is it, for using on a daily basis? No, we're, we're, we're always told we must prescribe the licensed product and the half-life of uh, sildenafil is only four hours, which means to give 24-hour coverage, it would have to be given ideally three times a day or at the very worst twice a day. And that's just not going to happen. Tadalafil with a half-life of 17 and a half hours is a perfect drug for continuous daily dosing. And the thing about these couples is that uh, uh, that what you do is you're treating the pathological process. The pathological process in ED is endothelial dysfunction. And that's a chronic condition that should be treated with chronic therapy, not treated for four hours on a Saturday night once a week. That just won't work. Uh, I think perhaps we should end with a, with a good news story, don't you? I mean, when we look at the observational studies on people taking regular PD-5 inhibitors, there's a very significant reduction in mortality by about 38%, isn't there? Do you want to just mention those two studies briefly? Yes, uh, there are two studies. One is uh, a UK study uh, from the group in Manchester that looked at uh, nearly 6,000 men with uh, type 2 diabetes who were treated with PD-5 inhibitors. And as Mike said, they followed them up for uh, six years and they found that uh, there was a nearly 40% reduction in all-cause mortality, which was mainly driven by cardiovascular mortality. And at the same time, unknown to the Manchester group, a group in uh, Sweden were looking at uh, a large number of men who had uh, something like 42,000 men who'd had a previous myocardial infarction and they followed them up for four years and they discovered that uh, the, there was a 40% reduction in subsequent uh, uh, myocardial events and mortality purely by taking a PD-5 inhibitor. Now, if you consider that we know that men with ED are at increased cardiovascular risk, having to be put on a PD-5 inhibitor actually probably meant you were at increased risk. And what they also found was that the more doses of PD-5 inhibitor you took, the lower the risk, which was strong evidence that we should be treating this chronic condition with daily therapy, not on demand. Of course, the patients who were treated with injection therapy uh, to restore their potency didn't get the benefit, did they? Not at all. No sign of any benefit from them. So there you are, Felix, the end of the good news story. Well, that was excellent stuff. Thank you both for that. Um, I think we're out of time now, though, so I just wanted to say thank you both very much for your time today. Um, a lot of important subjects were covered. Um,
So for our audience, Mike and Jeff have both written articles on these subjects that will be available alongside this video and that will contain all of the reference data that we've spoken about today. Once again, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank our speakers and we can uh, say goodbye. Okay, goodbye. Bye, thanks.